having some technical difficulties, uh, so I'll just uh, use both screens this time. Uh, but the stuff I'm going to be doing, hand draw uh, the examples from the book uh, on the tablet, those won't, won't be recorded. So um, having some issues trying to get the mirror from the tablet to the uh, laptop working, and I record on the laptop due to uh, technical limitations uh, with the graphics card and mirroring on, on tablets. Okay, uh, so where we left off, uh, oh yes, uh, there's a homework that I'll be posting right after this class uh, uh, on the Blackboard, and it will be due in one week uh, at the usual 11.59 and 59 seconds, one second before midnight. And these will basically be questions uh, from the book uh, based on the material uh, concerning uh, chapter one. Okay, any questions? No? All right, so where we left off, we talked about the four sources of packet delay. And these four source, uh, sources of delay are due uh, to the processing time, that is the examination uh, of the header information of the packet by uh, the router, right? And so as a so-called packet switch, uh, this router, uh, based upon that examination, uh, it looks at the destination address and then consults its forwarding table and then makes a so-called forwarding decision. Right? And when it makes that forwarding decision, it is only then uh, this packet is transmitted out some outgoing link one uh, bit at a time. And so that processing delay is one source of delay that a packet incurs because every single packet must be examined uh, uh, in that fashion and compared against the forwarding table within each of the packet switchers or routers. Now, if that packet arrives at the router, and there's currently a packet that's being processed, that packet is placed in a queue where it will wait until it's at the head of the queue um, and it'll be that packet's turn uh, to be transmitted, to be processed and transmitted. And so the queuing delay refers to the amount of time that a packet waits uh, in a queue and that queuing delay is considered to be infinite uh, if your packet gets dropped, right? Infinite because it never makes its way uh, out of, of the router. And the transmission delay refers to uh, the amount of time that is spent encoding that packet uh, as it's, uh, the one and zero bits are being sent down the wire. And so each bit at a time is sent down uh, that physical link, whether it's wired or wireless. And in the example, when we looked at CECOM and looked at the fiber optic strands, uh, that one bit refers to one particular uh, pulse uh, set of frequencies for pulses of laser light down the fiber optic strand, and a zero bit represents a different frequency of pulses uh, down the fiber optic strand. And so it takes time to encode all of these zero bits and one bits and send them down to wire. And that time is called a transmission delay. Now, that transmission delay certainly is a function of the size of the packet, because the more bits you have, the more time it's going to take uh, to encode each one of those bits. And so when we're trying to determine uh, what is the transmission delay, uh, we look at the size of the packet, L, uh, in the book, uh, as they call it, their convention, and we look at the transmission speed, or the bandwidth, if you will, of the communication links. And so some links uh, are less susceptible to interference and are also faster uh, in uh, doing that encoding. And the result is that it can push more data uh, uh, in a unit of time across that particular uh, communication medium. And so we also consider for a transmission delay the so-called link bandwidth, and that measurement is in bits per second, right? And again, as I had stressed uh, the last two uh, modules, is that it's really important to pay attention to your units. Lowercase b stands for bit, uppercase b stands for byte. So it's really, really important when you're solving these problems on the homework uh, to pay attention uh, to the units. And also it's important to uh, familiar, familiarize yourself or refamiliarize yourself if you've forgotten uh, with the metric system. So we express transmission delay as L over R, uh, L, uh, the number of bits to be transmitted and R, the rate at which those bits are transmitted. And the resulting units are in seconds. Uh, and lastly, we also have propagation delay. Uh, propagation delay refers to the time it takes uh, for this signal information to physically traverse that medium. If you're talking about uh, electromagnetic uh, signal energy in the air, 
uh, as is the case with wireless, that's the amount of time it takes uh, that information, that packet information, to go from the antenna of your machine to the antenna of the access point and vice versa. If you're talking about satellite, as you can imagine, satellite is much further away, that antenna, uh, than the terrestrial antenna on the surface of the Earth. So it takes a longer amount of time in addition to there being more sources of interference between the two antennas. Question. It's the time it takes uh, the endpoint uh, to encode the bits of that particular packet uh, for, trans uh, for, um, for transport down the, uh, down the wire, down the communication link. Okay. Any other questions? Does that make sense? And so the four sources of delay as it pertains to a packet switch are these four, the nodal delay. It is the sum of these four factors, the processing delay, the queuing delay, transmission delay, and the propagation delay. And it's really important to note that when you're looking at the end-to-end -end performance of some communication pathway, let's suppose you want to go from B uh, to this uh, second router here, right? You have to take account of all of the influences for every single hop along the way. So certainly if you're going to go from a machine to the first router, you're going to incur a transmission delay. And if you're going to go uh, across this router, you can have all these four sources and then across the link to the next router and so forth. So it's really important when you're problem solving to take into consideration all the accounting, if you will, of all the pieces of equipment that collectively form uh, the pathway from one source endpoint to another destination endpoint. Now, that being said, many times in some of these problems, uh, they'll say something like uh, the uh, propagation delay is negligible. And when you do that, you can just assume that D prop is zero, right? So pay attention to what is given, but also pay attention to what is negligible, meaning that you can, for all intents and purposes, consider it for that problem uh, to be zero, okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah, question. Packet length is the unit of data transfer. And so in any application, let's take, for example, um, since you all did the Wireshark, a browser, right? Uh, so you uh, send a web page, right? The, the server sends a web page back to your browser. And when you issue the HTTP GET, uh, you're asking the server, you're sending a message, and that message has text in it. And that message has a GET command, and this is sort of jumping ahead a little bit, and also a file system object. Right? And so what you're doing is your browser is sending this information. Now, information isn't sent a bit at a time from the logical standpoint from your computer. You have this entire message, and it's chopped up into standard size units. And these standard size units are your packets. And so each packet at a time, because it would kind of you know, be very inefficient, is every time you had a byte of information on your machine, you're going to send that as soon as you have it. Right? That's a waste of the bandwidth that you have. And so what they do... Um, is they take one 4096 worth, and that's what IP version 4 packet size is, one standardized unit of data, and once you fill up enough to form 4096 bytes of data, then your machine physically sends it across the network, and that unit is, is your packet. Now, is 4096 everywhere? No. It depends on your communication medium. It depends on your system. Uh, but that's standard for IP version 4 uh, as it pertains to routers and router backbones. But certainly some devices have a smaller uh, unit size, if you will, if you will uh, for your data. OK? All right. Any other questions? All right. So let's continue on. And of course, the transmission delay is very different from the propagation delay. And I'm stressing that because it's really easy to confuse. And there are some practitioners, many seasoned practitioners in computer networking that confuse the two all the time. Okay? They are different. All right. So let's continue on. And we'll pick up uh, with an example. This is in the book. And this kind of example isn't the only type of problem you'll get on homework, but it's indicative of the kind of thought process uh, that you will employ uh, when it comes to problems in the book. And this book makes an analogy, or tries to uh, draw analogies between human examples and network examples. And so, you know, it's pretty successful. Uh, so I'm going to go forward with that uh, example. And there are two different versions of a caravan. Uh, now, I don't know, you know, if you do that still. Certainly when I was an undergrad, uh, we did it. You know, if you were going on a trip, maybe spring break, um, you'd 
do a caravan. So you'd have a bunch of people who had cars or maybe rented a car, so forth, and you have a group of cars traveling down the highway, um, you know, to some destination somewhere. And so in this particular example, the caravan uh, set of cars uh, has 10 cars, right? And those 10 cars um, represent uh, the uh, packets, if you will, uh, for a particular message. And so here, uh, you have your 10 cars and each toll booth you come to, and I know you have like easy pass and all that stuff, but humor the example, please. Uh, the toll booth uh, looks like the router, the packet switch. And so when the cars come to the toll booth, I remember, uh, and it's funny to say in the old days, it wasn't that long ago, um, when you drive up to the toll booth, you used to stop get a ticket from the attendant, and then you'd go on to the next toll booth. And when you're coming off the highway, you go to the toll booth, and you hand your ticket, and based on the distance uh, uh, for the town where you entered uh, the toll highway, uh, they would calculate the price you pay, and then you pay them, and then you're on your way, right? And so the toll booth, like a router or packet switch, it takes time uh, to process each one of these uh, packets. Right. Uh, in the case of a toll, it's examining the toll ticket. Uh, in the case of a packet on a packet switch, it's examining the header information, consulting the forwarding table and making a forwarding decision. And so these cars, once they make it onto the other side of the toll booth, um, they need to traverse some distance to get to the next toll booth. And if you treat a toll booth as an analog of a router, here you have one router. Uh, here on the left, uh, representing the, uh, represented by the toll booth, and the other toll booth would be your uh, other router. Now, the roadway length between the two toll booths you can think of as some communication medium. And in truth, communication media stretch across some distance. Uh, these undersea cables go many thousands of miles, something like a Category 5, Cat 5, or Cat 6 cable. These cables you see here for network cable, they're twisted copper pairs of copper wire. Those things might go tens to hundreds of feet. Right, coaxial cable in your uh, neighborhood uh, for uh, cable head end for hybrid fiber coax for cable modem. Uh, those things would go maybe you know a few hundred feet, right? Not thousands of feet. Okay, so we have our communication link, uh, which is the roadway in this example, and that roadway given uh, in this problem is 100 kilometers long. Now these cars, when they drive along the roadway, uh, they drive at 100 kilometers per hour. Right, uh, and you can think of that as the speed uh, at which this packet makes its way uh, down uh, the communication link. So we're given all of this information, and in addition, it's given to you that the toll booth uh, takes 12 seconds in order to service a car, right? And you can think of this as a transmission rate. It takes 12 seconds in order to send this uh, unit of data across the wire. Okay, so any questions about the problem setup? No questions, all right. So the question asks you, how long until the caravan is lined up before the second toll booth? And remember, when you're talking about packet switching, well, the entire packet must end up at the next router before it can be forwarded uh, to the next, out the, uh, the next outbound link, right? And so here, it's given to you all of this information, and yes, it is an analogy, and it's asking how long in order for all of these cars uh, to be lined up before that second toll booth. So taking that into consideration, and I'll just sit down here, uh, we have our toll booth here. So here is the second toll booth, I'll call that T2. And then we have here the first toll booth, I'll call that T1. And then we have our communication link, and that communication link is 100 kilometers as given by the problem statement. Now, it doesn't matter how long it is, but you have to make sure you're using the numbers uh, that are given to you. Now, the configuration of interest here says until the caravan is lined up before uh, the second toll booth. So that means you want to be in an ending configuration where the first car is here, and then right behind it in line are all of the other cars. Call it C10 for the 10th car, right? And so what has to happen in order for that configuration uh, to be reached? Well, we have our cars starting here in front of the first toll booth, the C1. C2 is right behind it, up to and including the 10th car, C10. Now, what happens? Okay, well, the first car gets processed. Now, after the first car gets processed, 
it's on the other side, the road side of the toll booth, and then it proceeds down the roadway at that rate of 100 kilometers per hour. So then, right after the first car, C1, is on the other side of the toll booth, now C2, and I'll just draw it down here, is right at the toll booth, and then it takes 12 seconds uh, to get processed by the toll booth, and then it goes on the roadside of the toll booth, right? So in order for that to happen, well, let me ask you, um, what has to happen uh, before all the cars can be at the second toll booth? Anyone want to put yourself out there? No? What has to happen? You have to process all 10 cars, right? Each of the 10 cars has to be processed by toll booth one. And if each of the 10 cars has to be processed by toll booth one, that means you're going to have the 12 second processing time for the first car, the 12 second processing time for the second car, 12 second processing time for the third car, up to and including 12 second processing time for the 10th car. So that means 10 times 12 second processing per car. After that amount of time, here's toll booth T1. So after 12 times 10, 12 seconds times 10, that's 120 seconds, right? You have this configuration. You have C10 is on the road side of the toll booth. And then somewhere along the wire is C9 through C1. And there's toll booth T2. Does that make sense? So each one of these cars in the caravan, you can't jump the line. You can't go to a different toll booth. It's just one toll booth, right? So the first car pays a cost of 12 second delay to be processed. And then the second car is at the front of the line, gets processed. Then the third car, then the fourth car, then the fifth car, up to and including the 10th car. So after 120 seconds, uh, you have the 10th car now is on the other side of the toll booth and beginning to travel uh, this 100 kilometers. Does that make sense? Okay. So if that's the case, okay, in order for the entire caravan to be lined up over here in front of toll booth T2, nope, that showed up on my laptop, on my tablet, but not on the screen. That's weird. Let me circle it again. That's, there we go. Now it both showed up. Okay. Um, in order for that configuration to be reached, well, what has to happen is that car number C10, that last car in the caravan, has to be processed by toll booth T1, and then car C10 has to now travel that 100 kilometers, right? Okay. So what has to happen for car C10 uh, to be processed? Well, for car C10 to be processed, well, that means cars C1 up through C9 have been processed. So after the full 120 seconds, car C10 is now on the roadside of the toll booth uh, number one. Okay? All right. Make sense? Okay. So then what then happens is car C10 has to now travel across that roadway to toll booth T2. Now, the problem states that it's 100 kilometers to get from toll booth T1 to toll booth T2. If you're traveling 100 kilometers per hour and it's 100 kilometers, well, um, time is the distance over the speed. So you have 100 kilometers divided by 100 kilometers per hour, right? That's equal to, well, you have 100 over 100. Oh, well, that's the numbers. You have kilometers over kilometers, and then you have hour, right? So the kilometers uh, cancel. The 100 over 100, that goes to 1. So that's equal to 1 hour or 60 minutes, right? So it takes that 10th car or any car 60 minutes or 1 hour to translate along the highway between the first toll booth and the second toll booth. So it takes 1 hour for C10 to be in this configuration where C10 is lined up right before the toll booth. Now, because C10 was the last car to be processed, by definition, if C10 is waiting at the second toll booth, that means C1 through C9 have already arrived there because it's the last one out of the gate uh, of the first toll booth. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions? All right. So what does that mean? In order for the entire caravan to be lined up in front of the second toll booth, C10 has to get processed. 
and C10 has to propagate along this 100 kilometers. So for C10 to get processed, it takes 12 seconds times 10 cars or 120 seconds, which is equal to two minutes, right? Because 60 seconds in a minute. And then it takes an additional 60 minutes uh, for C10 to get across the wire. So you have the 60 minutes plus the two minutes is a total of 62 minutes. Does that make sense? Any questions? It's really quiet in here. Yes, question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you wanted to map that, so for a big technological fail, let me see if I can create a new slide here. Because this, uh, keep, um, insert, new slide. Uh, let me delete this and delete that. Ah, okay, good. Um, slideshow from current. There we go. All right. So to answer your question, imagine you had an image, a picture of something, right? And let's just say for the sake of consideration, uh, that picture um, fit in a single packet, right? It was a single unit of data, right? And so, you know, let me just draw it like, you know, I'm not an artist, so I'm in the right field. And there's my artwork. It's you in front of your house. And don't pay attention to the fact that you're bigger than your house, right? So you have this data, and this data, let's just assume it can fit in a packet. And you send it into a router. So computer scientists aren't very good, unless you're in graphics, uh, aren't very good at, uh, at artwork. But I'll try my best. There we go. Let's say this data is at a packet switch. And if you're going to transfer this data across the wire, let's just assume that each square here, I'm going to chop it up into pieces, is a bit of information. Now, if I'm going to send this over the wire, I'm going to send it one bit at a time, right? And I know that's not a bit, but just humor me. So this has to be first, that has to be second, third, fourth, fifth, and I go across, row by row uh, in this uh, image. So now, when it's received at the other side, well, how is it received? Well, the first one arrives and it's filled in. The second one arrives and it's filled in. The third one arrives and it's filled in. So in order to send this message across the wire, it's encoded bit by bit, and those bits travel down the wire. So at some point, if three is here, that means four is here, and five is here, and six is here, and so forth. And they travel down the wire bit by bit, in some order, and they're reassembled at the endpoint where they wait at the router, okay? And so in similar fashion with this caravan, well, and I was mistaken in my description, um, you can consider them bits, or if you want to say packets, I think it's bits. Each car is a bit, yeah, it's right there on the slide, and the whole caravan is a packet, okay? And so each bit has to be sent down the wire in some order. In similar fashion, if we were going to send a graphic bit by bit or piece by piece, you send them some order. First, the first piece gets sent, the second, third, fourth, and so forth. So the first arrives, it's assembled into the uh, to reconstruct the original image, and then the second one arrives, the third one arrives. If the third one has arrived, the next one to arrive is going to be the fourth one, and then the fifth one, and the sixth one. So if this last one, and let's just say this is uh, four by four, um, so going across, 16 is the last one. Right? In order for this entire image to be sent across the wire bit by bit, well, 16 is going to be the last one sent. Right? In similar fashion, for this entire caravan to get across the wire, that last or tenth car has to be the last one sent. And so in order to send the entire caravan, the last one sent has to have arrived at the second toll booth. Does that make sense? All right, any questions about this? So this analogy uses cars to represent bits, and it's the caravan, which is the packet. A packet is just a collection of bits. Okay? All right. So the answer to the question, how long uh, does it take for uh, the entire caravan uh, to be lined up in front of the second toll booth? It's the cost of sending, uh, transmitting each of the cars through the first toll booth, and then the cost of the propagation 
of that last car, which is one hour or 60 minutes. And so our result is 62 minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So here we made an accounting of the time it takes to process, the processing time uh, at the toll booth, and then the propagation, the time it takes to go across. Okay. All right. 62 minutes. All right. So let's have a nuanced take on this problem. And the next problem, it's the same or similar, for the most part, a similar problem. But now they change the speed at which these cars move down the roadway. And in particular, they say the propagation speed. Now, you can imagine uh, something like somebody replacing a uh, uh, coaxial cable or replacing uh, a cat five cable copper cable uh, with fiber optic strand right the propagation speed of fiber optic strand is much faster and so it's a similar problem but now it's asking a different question so let's start with the question and then unpack all of the information that's given okay so the question is will cars arrive to the second booth before all the cars are serviced at the first booth and what does that look like? Well, it looks a lot like this diagram uh, that I've drawn here. You have some of the packet at the next hop, right? And some of the packet has yet to be encoded for transmission down the wire. So can you have part of it on one part of the network while the other part is at some other part, right? Absolutely you can. And so it's asking, will they arrive at the second booth before all of the cars are serviced at the first toll booth, right? And so here the numbers for the lengths are still 100 kilometers, but what they're changing is the propagation speed. In the previous example, the first example, cars move down the roadway at 100 kilometers per hour. Now they're making the speed 10 times faster, 1,000 kilometers per hour. So if they're moving faster down the wire, what that's going to impact is this portion of the journey. So you have the first toll booth, you have the second toll booth, right? Uh, and it's going to impact how fast it takes or the time it takes a car to traverse this distance that 100 kilometers, right? So let's take a look at that portion of the accounting for this problem. And so we have 100 kilometers, that's the distance. And the new speed is going to be 1,000 kilometers per hour. Okay, so let's unpack this. So we have 100, the number, over 1,000. Okay, we have kilometers over kilometers times hours. Okay, so 100 over 1,000, that's just one-tenth. Kilometers over kilometers, that goes to one. And we have one-tenth of an hour. Well... If an hour is 60 minutes, one-tenth of that is six minutes. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? No? All right. So that means it's going to take six minutes for a car to get from toll booth one to toll booth two if it's traveling at a rate of 1,000 kilometers per hour. Okay? All right. So let's move on. First, any questions before I move on? No? All right. So I'm going to... Um, Ah, all right. I wish it could just let me create a new slide very easily. Keep. Um, insert. Uh, let me insert a new slide. I wish there were a way to do a blank slide, but we'll figure that out uh, in time. So, uh, slideshow, current slide. And I'll also, you know, if you want, I can post this on, on the uh, Blackboard alongside um, the lecture slide uh, for the first chapter. So we have that six minutes under this new assumption of 1,000 kilometers per hour. And um, let's see, second booth, three cars still. Uh, yeah, okay. So it takes six minutes, and I think they changed the number. Okay, uh, that's what I'm forgetting. And so the toll booth in this example, so they changed two things. They changed the speed at which they traverse over the uh, uh, on the roadway, and that's now six minutes to travel the 100 kilometers. And then they also changed the specification that um, the toll booth, instead of taking 12 seconds to process a car, in this case, the toll booth takes one minute to service each car. So you can imagine, you know, if a car is a bit, uh, the packet switch is taking uh, one minute 
uh, to process each bit. Now, that's just a fictitious example. They're usually a lot faster than that uh, as far as real packet switches. But it's still, this human analogy exhibits uh, some of the same qualities of uh, practical problems uh, that you'll be solving on the homework. OK, so let's take a look at this. So we have toll booth T1. And lined up in front of T1, you have the first car, C1, the second car, C2, and then you have up to and including C10, the 10th car. Now, between toll booth 1 and toll booth T2, it says it's 100 kilometers. And we know from before, it's going to take you six minutes for a car to traverse that 100 kilometers and line up in front of uh, toll booth T2. Okay. So if each one, it takes a minute to be processed at the toll booth, well, let's see what happens. So after one minute, we have C1 on the roadway side of the toll booth. Okay. Now in the next minute, at two minutes, what happens? Well, between the one minute mark and the two minute mark, now you have C2 on the roadway side of the toll booth, and C1 is some point along the roadway because it's now traveling along the roadway. It's in flight along uh, the roadway. You could think, consider it's in flight on a conductor, on a, on a conductive path, a uh, communication medium. So then at the three minute mark, C3 is now on the roadway side, and C1 has continued to propagate. C2 is propagating, so C2 is somewhere along the roadway, and C1 is somewhere along the roadway in front of it, right? So now at the four minute mark, you have C4, and the others are on the roadway further along. At the five minute, you have C5. At the six minute, you have C6, okay? Now, at the seventh minute, you're gonna have C7 here on the roadway side of the toll booth. C6 is somewhere down the road, C5, is somewhere down the road, C2 is somewhere down the road, but C1 is now right at the second toll booth. And so why is C1 right at the second toll booth? How do I know that? Well, at the first minute, C1 was here. Now going from the first minute to the seventh minute, I had a total of six minutes of time that transpired, right? So what's the relevance of that six minutes? Oh, wait a minute. It takes six minutes to travel down the length of the wire, right? And so in that six minutes, I know for a fact that C1 is going to be lined up right at toll booth T2. Does that make sense? Okay. So at the seven minute mark, I have C7 on the roadway side. Well, if the toll booth side is over here, right, on the left, and then let me just draw a little dotted line here to note where the toll booth is. That means I have C8 right up next to toll booth uh, T1, C9, and C10 are still in front of toll booth T1. Does that make sense? And so after seven minutes, I'm in this configuration. I have C7 is just to the right of toll booth T1, it's on the roadway side. C1 is right up against toll booth T2. And C6 through C2 are what's called in flight, right? They're still along their journey on the roadway between uh, toll booth T1 and toll booth T2. Does that make sense? Okay. So the question asks, will cars arrive to the second toll booth uh, before all cars are serviced at the first one? Absolutely. And we've just shown that after seven minutes, the first car arrives at the second booth but the three cars, namely C8, C9, and C10, are still lined up in front of the first toll booth. And that is exactly an example of the previous slide. Oh. Hmm, it did not update. All right, it's kind of lagging in a weird way. All right, hopefully it stays. Sometimes I hate technology. Anyways, so that is exactly an instance of this part of the picture up above where I talked about the image. If an image occupies a full packet, there are parts of the packet that'll be lined up at the second router, 
while other parts of the packet have yet to be sent, and while other packets are in flight along the wire. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions about this? Okay, and so this is just to reiterate that you should really think carefully about all of the things the question gives you, but also take a full accounting of all the things that happen along the way and sort of compute the time associated with each one of those things along the way between the source and the destination endpoint. And I will post these things on the, uh, on the Blackboard uh, after this class. Okay, and that's why I really wish I could do the screencast because I want to include this drawing stuff in the uh, in the screencast. So, you know, sometimes technology fails. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. So let me do this. Let's continue on. So, more generally, we talked about that idea of the transmission and the packet can straddle uh, between one router and the next router. Um, let's talk a little bit about what happens in the router, specifically the queuing. Now, this queuing delay is really an artifact that has to do with the rate at which your router or your packet switch can push bits out relative to the rate at which bits come in. Now, of course, one machine isn't the only machine sending data into a router, right? Uh, just even in this classroom, what, there are like 16, 17 of you, and you're all sending information back and forth to the access point, and that's just this class. There are other classrooms doing the same thing, right? And so typically, uh, you talk about the flow, the rate at which data comes into the router or packet switch relative to the rate at which data leaves the router. And so the, the rate at which data comes into the router is greater than the rate at which the router can push that data out. That data has to collect somewhere. And where it collects is in the buffering, specifically the queue uh, in the router. And the more packets you have queuing in the router, the longer, if you're towards the end of the line, the longer you're going to have to wait, kind of like the registrar's office, right? But they're always congested. I'm going to cut that part out. But anyways, so they're always congested. And um, if you have a lot of congestion, that means your buffers in your router tend to be full most of the time or more of the time. And so there's typical measurement uh, called the traffic intensity. And what the traffic intensity looks at is the aggregate amount of data coming into the router relative to the aggregate amount of data leaving the router. And so here we have the link bandwidth in bits per second, R. We have the packet length, and they also introduce with this uh, notion, uh, A, the average packet arrival rate. Because packets arrive, if you took my uh, stochastic class, it's modeled as a Poisson distribution. And you can actually literally um, simulate what are called network flows and use that to inform how you should choose your router infrastructure. So that's not something we talked about in class, but it's one of the ways that people use uh, stochastic simulations all the time, right, when you're designing your network. Because if it's a critical network, let's say you work at Netflix in the infrastructure team, um, you don't want to try it and see what happens because if something breaks, all of a sudden the consequences could mean millions and millions upon uh, millions of dollars uh, lost uh, by Netflix. So what do they do? They model their network. Uh, they introduce things like Poisson distributions to model the arrival rate of packets. They know the standard size of the packets and they look at what the average queuing delay is in the simulation. Right? It's a really big deal for a lot of data center uh, concerns. So nonetheless, A is the average packet arrival rate. And if we multiply the arrival rate times the size of the packet, that results in a number of bits uh, per second that are coming in aggregate to this, pack, uh, to this packet switch. So LA uh, talks about the data coming into a particular packet switch. And then R uh, bits per second uh, talks about the amount of data, that's, uh, the rate at which data is transmitted or the uh, rate at which data flows out of the router. And so, if LA over R, this quantity LA over R, the numerator LA is the amount of data flowing into the router, and the denominator R is the rate at which data flows out of the router. And so LA over R, if this ratio is zero, what does that mean? It means the denominator R is much bigger than LA, and that means that the router can transmit data, push data out of the router uh, faster, much faster than it comes in. And if that's the case, this LA over R, or so-called traffic intensity, is going to be very, very small. 
Now, if it's closer to zero or very, very small, what happens? That means your buffers are not going to be very big in your routers. They're going to be mostly empty. And if they're mostly empty, that means the delay, i.e. the lines aren't long, so that means the person at the end of the line is not going to wait very long on average, right? And so this LA over R called traffic intensity in the following graph on the horizontal axis, we have traffic intensity, um, LA over R, and on the vertical axis, we have the average queuing delay, which would be measured in seconds, right? And so if LA over R is close to zero, that means the queuing delay is small. Things are really good, okay? Uh, conversely, if LA over R is equal to one, what does that mean? It means the numerator, the amount of data that's coming into the router, uh, and the denominator, the amount of data or the rate at which data leaves the router, they're very close to one another, because that's what it means for LA over R to be equal to one. So what happens if the rate of inflow is equal to roughly the rate of outflow? Well, you're gonna get some queuing delay because conceivably these are averages, but it's gonna spike up and it might spike down a little bit. So this results in a large queuing delay. Things will still work, but this is where you're gonna to start to see slowdowns in your end-to-end -end flows. Now remember, this not only happens in the single router, but if you in aggregate add this up over a bunch of hops from source to destination endpoint, um, it makes a significant difference. So if LA over R is equal to one, of course, your queuing delay starts to get large. Now, what happens in this last bit, LA over R is greater than one. What does that mean? It means the numerator is larger than the denominator. So the amount of data that flows into the router is greater than the amount of data or the rate at which it leaves the router. So that means there's much more work, much more data coming in than the router is able to push out. And if it can't keep up, it'll fill its buffers queue things, delay will happen, and then eventually it means it's going to run out of space. And when we studied was that when it runs out of space, it needs to drop a packet and you're going to get what's called loss. And so here in this traffic intensity plot, we see that as LA over R gets close to one, your delay starts to increase. You get this, uh, this exponential uh, behavior in the graph, and then eventually it goes to infinity. And when it goes to infinity, that means that your packet is dropped and you lose information. Now, you know, there are facilities uh, in applications and in the transport layer that will say, okay, if I lose information, I can detect that and I can resend. But what you see as an end-to-end -end application is that maybe your sound file, if you're streaming music, it just sounds weird. Or maybe, you know, your, your video frame, if you're watching a movie, it kind of jumps and is jittery and so forth. Now, there's some applications where you absolutely can't afford that, and there are remedies at the transport layer to correct for that, uh, but the consequence is a reduction in the end-to-end -end, uh, throughput, okay? So if you want a high-performance application, you have to make a choice. Uh, either you have reliability or you have raw speed, but if you opt for raw speed on one extreme, you have to deal with packet loss, okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, let's check the time. 1248. All right, so this traffic intensity, LA over R equals zero, it's like the highways are wide open. Uh, LA over R greater than one, it's like driving in Boston, or if you're from DC area, I've driven in beltway traffic before, it's not fun. Um, it's like driving in a major metro area traffic during the height of rush hour, you're not going anywhere, right? Okay. All right, any questions about this? Make sense? So this traffic intensity is certainly a plot that you can keep and you can actually update over time actively about the profile of each router and get a picture of the end-to-end -end throughput uh, of your network. Okay? And data centers care a lot about this. I care tremendously much about this. Okay. So the real internet, of course, when we talk about this traffic intensity, it's expressed from the perspective of a single router. But when you go from one source to one destination endpoint, there's more than just one router or hop along the way. Now, of course, you might ask yourself, well, for the real internet, what does this delay look like? Because that looks pretty daunting, right? Well, certainly things are measured on a scale of millisecond. Milli is 10 to the minus three. Micro is 10 to the minus six. Uh, so it's measured on the scale 
of milliseconds, and there are lots and lots and lots of diagnostic tools to help you get a sense of what the flows on your network look like. Now, oftentimes in network analysis and data center performance stuff, they care about so-called flows, the pathway, i.e. the collection of hops between the source and destination endpoint. And one of the things you do in network traffic engineering is you're trying to shape or direct that traffic uh, in different paths, if you will, so that you can try to balance that load so that everyone gets good aggregate end-to-end -end, uh, throughput. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your router is doing. What matters is what the entire pathway is doing because your customers, if you're Netflix, they don't care about some obscure link somewhere along the path. They care that they can watch Game of Thrones or whatever um, on their browser. And so they don't blame uh, Verizon. They blame you. They blame Netflix if there's a problem because you know they're not sophisticated like yourselves and they won't say, well, you know, the end-to-end -end throughput is degraded because this link is encountering uh, congestion on the router that arbitrates it, right? Uh, so Traceroute is a program that provides you actual delay measurements uh, for routers along the way between your machine from which you run it and some identifiable uh, host on the other side of the internet. And so what it does, it sends special packets uh, called ICMP, Internet Message Control Protocol Packets. Uh, specifically, it's an ICMP echo request. And what this thing does, uh, it sets a number uh, called the hop count. And every time this packet visits a router or any packet visits a router, it's decremented by one. And once it reaches zero, uh, the router returns back an error message. And so what Traceroute does, it sends three packets to each router with an increasingly uh, large uh, hop count. And in effect, it gets back a contact uh, echo message uh, from each router along the pathway between the source and the destination endpoint. And so it sets a stopwatch or starts a stopwatch when it sends the message, and it stops the stopwatch when it receives the response from the router and displays for you uh, the time it took round trip, which is a proxy for the amount of congestion uh, along the route. Okay, all right, any questions about this? So we'll take a look at what uh, Traceroute looks like. So it sends three probes, and a probe is just three uh, ICMP echo request messages, each one with a hop count of one. So that means the echo comes back from the first router or the gateway, uh, default gateway, and then it does it with a hop count of two, and then a hop count of three, and so forth until it reaches the destination. Okay, uh, so this is what a Traceroute message looks like. Here you'll see a bunch of columns. Uh, the first column on the left, your left, is the hop. Right. Uh, the, sec uh, the second column is the host name uh, associated with each of the routers. And uh, optionally, it has the Internet Protocol address or IP address. So here, the first hop is CS Gateway, uh, and it has an IP address of 128.119.240.254. The first probe had a round trip time of one millisecond. The second probe uh, was one millisecond. And the third probe had a round trip time of two milliseconds. Right. Uh, so let's pop out of the slides. Let me take another time check. I really need to buy a new watch. Um, 12.52. Let's pop out of this momentarily. And let me bring up the console. Um, and we can take a look at what Traceroute looks like. New window. Um, homebrew. OK. It might be trace RT on your uh, platform, I think in Windows. So let me see which trace route. Okay, so trace route. And so somebody just shout out a, a, a host name, like a domain name. Google. Okay, so Google, and we'll try another one. And you said uh, YouTube. All right. YouTube is owned by Google. Um, let's try something overseas, if anyone knows one. Uh, BP. I, let me do that. It was weird when you don't have stereo hearing. Can you say that again? OK, all right. So here we see, so we did the trace route, Google. And it sets a maximum of 64 hops at instruments. So we're, we're on the 10 network which is the private domain for CIS Wi-Fi. And then we go to new VMware admins desu.edu. It's a virtualized host uh, serving up this function. And we see another 
one, hmm, that might be some Comcast thing, the lighttower.net. And then we're going to level three communications, right, on the sixth top in Washington, DC. And then we're going switching through uh, the infrastructure of level three uh, communications from Washington. It's probably going on a, a, a trunk line uh, to get to somewhere on the West Coast. And then we see uh, Washington level three.net. It looks like it's going to Google. So there must be an internet exchange point somewhere in a data center in Washington, DC, that's uh, pushing data from level three to Google's data center because Google is a content provider and they run their own national uh, ISP because they don't want to pay all that money uh, to some other service provider. And then we have a bunch of other IP addresses in Google's network. And then eventually we get to google.com, AMS, blah, 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 dot net. And I'm not too sure <laughs> what that means. I don't know Google's uh, details of the internal infrastructure. Um, but we certainly have all of the IP addresses for all the routers along the way. Now, when you set up a router as an administrator uh, of a network, um, you have the choice as to whether or not you want your router to respond to so-called ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, echo requests, which is what Traceroute uses, because some people consider it a security risk um, to respond to these messages. And so sometimes it'll just pause and have these stars that it writes out because that particular router uh, on one of the hops along the way between the source and the destination uh, is configured not to respond. And if you think about it, if it responds, now it's identifiable. So if you wanted to launch an attack to bring down someone's infrastructure, um, you would just identify a critical router along the way and just bombard that thing with traffic and you'd be successful, right? Uh, so some believe or think uh, so if you wanted to, um, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, trace route army dot, dot mil, right? So that's the army's website. I mean, I'm not doing anything wrong, but <laughs> so it goes into the same trunk line and now Washington level three. And you notice here, now it's returning a bunch of stars, right? because they don't want you to know what the name and identity is, the name or the address of their uh, web infrastructure. So you'll see this star here. That's probably where it's making its way um, to some gateway or something that they don't want you to know about. And it's not that it's you know classified or whatever. It's just that they feel it's a security risk and they choose to set it up not to respond. Question. Um, because of the military and uh, they don't want people, you know, it's pretty embarrassing if some hacker group uh, compromised uh, army.mil's website and maybe they posted, you know, uh, uh, army sucks, go Marines, you know, or something like that. I mean, not that a hacker would do that, but they, they'd probably post something else, right? So what if you saw uh, Al Qaeda post something on army's website, right? That would be pretty embarrassing and actually pretty scary, right? Uh, and so, uh, there, people have different ideas about levels of security. Um, and uh, in this organization, army.mil, they feel that whatever hop seven is, that it's best that it not respond because they don't want it to be identified. You can't attack something that you can't identify, right? And so that's the idea. And so it's just a matter of what your philosophy is. You could choose to, or you could not choose to. Um, I kind of sway more on the side of being more protective than less, uh, but that's just me. Um, each person has his or her own um, philosophy about that. But certainly, if you're dealing with critical infrastructure, like let's say uh, banking, right? And you have a router that serves traffic for the ATM machine network, right? You're probably not gonna have that respond, right? You're just gonna print out stars, not have respond. Because if somebody uh, has a banking network and let's say all the ATMs in Delaware for WSFS Bank, uh, we're connected through ultimately some gateway router. Well, if somebody identifies that, um, now you can uh, attack it, and then all of a sudden data won't get to and from the ATMs, and no one can use the ATM machines for a period of time, right? And so for certain applications, it's obvious that you just don't want it to be identifiable. You can't attack what you can't identify, okay? All right. Any questions? Any more questions about this? All right. So let me go back to the slides. And that's real example of trace route. And again, like everything, I encourage you uh, to um, to tinker with these things. Uh, there's a command called ping 
um, do not use ping on a sensitive website. I'll say that because ping, while it'll allow you to verify the existence of a server, um, it floods that machine with a lot of data and that can be perceived as someone trying to attack uh, a site. Uh, so you don't want to do that uh, uh, with sensitive sites. Uh, but traceroute, you're just getting path information and they can respond or not respond. Uh, but I also wouldn't you know, write a script and have that script run from a hundred different places and run trace routes on the same thing. Um, that could be perceived as someone who's attempting to attack uh, a network. So you know, use your good judgment, uh, but do tinker with it uh, to try to you know, look at how things are interconnected. Now, of course, if you go onto a different network, this is CIS Wi-Fi I'm connected to, but if you connect to DSU Wireless, it's going to go through a different infrastructure uh, or pathway because uh, it's a different service provider uh, than CIS Wi-Fi, and you're going to see something called Magpie uh, that goes in through UPAD uh, for connection to internet, right? And so it's going to differ for CIS Wi-Fi because that's through Comcast versus D DSU Wi-Fi or, or D DSU Wireless, which I believe Cogent is the university's uh, um, gateway provider. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? All right. So that's trace route and packet loss. I forgot what I was going to say here. I think I already said that. Ah, you know what? I was assuming I would cut the, the module and then pick back up here. Um, so that's why I repeat a slide. Let me check the time, make sure 101. So we have about 12 minutes. Okay. Uh, so we have packet loss. Packets can be dropped uh, if it meets a full buffer and a router. Um, certainly they queue and that takes time as those packets are waiting and that all affects your end-to-end -end, uh, throughput uh, for the application uh, you're using. Okay, so let's take a look at throughput in general. And so throughput, when you talk about so-called end-to-end throughput, and I've said that uh, term uh, quite a few times, end-to-end uh, -end throughput relates to uh, the perception of speed as it pertains to data that traffics between two endpoints uh, going in between some number of hops visiting various components or parts of the internet infrastructure. And so here we have a server, and let's say that server is sitting in a data center somewhere, and maybe it's streaming video, you've selected a movie on Netflix, and you know, you're now watching that movie. Well, data is coming off of some server, uh, and it's making its way over a number of hops, traversing both communication links, as well as going through packet switches, uh, some number of hops to get to your machine, and you're watching it uh, as a stream. Now, this is whether it's a computer or maybe it's some set-top device like a Roku or, or, or what have you. Uh, it's all the same, right? And so throughput refers to the rate at which bits are transferred between the sender and receiver. And when we talk about the sender and receiver, I don't mean all of the components uh, uh, in between. I mean the endpoints themselves. Right? Because it's really, really important uh, what the perception is of speed as it pertains to the applications uh, running at the endpoints. And these are on the edge devices at the, uh, the or hosts on the edges of the network. And so here we have a server, and that server is giving you a file and has F many bits that is sending to a client. Uh, so that server is responding to a request for a movie, and it sends it across a link. And typically that server will have some link uh, it has a bandwidth associated R sub S and that link visits a router and it doesn't have to be a single router. It could be a bunch of routers connected by some link, but the general framework that they use to describe end to end flows is that you have a server side and you have a client side and there's some switching fabric in between stitching the two together. And so you have the data flowing uh, from the router into a route infrastructure of some sort and it comes off the route infrastructure and it makes its way onto the client side, ultimately through the access network of the client. Now, on the client side, you have a link, and that link has a capacity, and that's R bits per second. And so in the book, it's labeled R sub C uh, to represent the client side link uh, uh, bandwidth. Okay? Uh, so affecting your ability to watch a movie is not only your internet speed that you subscribe to, it's also the internet speed that the service provider subscribes to. Right? Those two have to line up uh, in order uh, for you to have a good end-to-end -end experience. So, oftentimes, uh, the terminology in the research literature is called fluid simulation. You can almost think of these as pipes, and the, the size or the width of the pipe will accommodate more fluid, right? If you have a bigger pipe, fluid flows faster at a faster rate. 
And so literally, oh, when they do large network simulation, they often pretend data is fluid and they look at flow rate because there are many tools from mechanical engineering that you can apply for aggregate data performance, right? And so you can think of uh, fluid or the amount of fluid or water, if you will, as being your data. And you can think of the transmission rate of each link as being the width of a pipe because a bigger pipe uh, gives you more fluid over time, okay? And so here you have a pipe that can carry fluid on the server side of the infrastructure at R sub S bits per second, and then another one on the client side of the infrastructure at R sub C uh, bits per second. Now, of course, end to end, what's gonna dictate uh, your perception of speed between the application endpoints is gonna be the smallest pipe along the route. So for example, you could subscribe to a service with one gigabit per second upload, uh, up, up, upload upstream and downstream uh, for your bandwidth. But if the service provider is only doing 10 megabit per second upstream and downstream, the most you'll ever see your data from this provider uh, is at the 10 megabit per second, not the gigabit per second that you subscribe to. Because what matters is the smallest pipe along the route. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay. So we can have a number of scenarios. Suppose the bandwidth on the server side of the infrastructure, R sub S, is much smaller than the client side of the infrastructure. Uh, the average end-to-end -end throughput is going to be dictated by R sub S. It doesn't matter how fast your connection is. If the server side infrastructure is slow, you're going to get that data from the server slowly. It's limited by or constrained by the bandwidth of the server side infrastructure. Likewise, if R sub S, the server side infrastructure is very fast. Let's say they have, you know, um, you know, 100 megabit or maybe it's two or 10 gigabit connection and you subscribe to the 10 megabit connection, right? So they have 100 gigabit and you have 10 megabit. The fastest you're going to get that content is going to be constrained by your connection. So again, here, uh, it's limited uh, by the slowest link uh, along the route from end to end, okay? And so here we have this idea of a so-called bottleneck link, right? Uh, if you take an accounting of the transmission speed of links along the way, and you can actually uncover this sort of stuff with tools like Traceroute, um, your communication is only going to be as fast as the slowest link along the route, right? Uh, because that data end to end, well, it can get in this lower case here from the server to the uh, packet switch very quickly, but it's going to get from the packet switch to your client very slowly. And so the bottleneck link, the slowest link, always dictates uh, the upper bound on the end-to-end -end performance of any communication flow between two endpoints. So if you have a slow connection and you're trying to do a Google Street View drive around, it's going to be slow, right? If you have a fast connection and Google's connection is also fast, it's going to be fast. If you have, for whatever reason, a slow connection with Google, which is typically not the case, but your connection is fast, it's going to be slow. Right? And so when you deploy network applications, it's really, really important to consider the end-to-end -end flows. And so typically, uh, in most purveyors of uh, network uh, services, they like to have multiple pathways uh, because something could happen. Maybe you get a lot of congestion. Maybe a lot of people in that area are starting to use the network uh, or some other reason. And so people try to fix this by having multiple pipes to get between the source and the destination endpoint. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So this bottleneck link is going to constrain the end-to-end -end, uh, performance of your flows. And this is a little bit more typical of what happens. You have more than one client and more than one server that are sharing pipes, right? So in this particular example, we have a bunch of server instances. Right? They could be in the same data center, but they don't have to be in the same data center. You could have different organizations uh, that are using the same service provider. And ultimately, once you get onto the service provider or ISP's network, all that data is being aggregated and pushed over some pathway uh, to some other endpoint. And so here we have uh, the server connection or the server pipes, if you will, getting that data at some particular bandwidth R sub S. And then here on the client side, the consumers of that content or that data, uh, they have their pipes or their connections uh, to the infrastructure. 
right? Uh, and their speeds are at R sub C in terms of the bandwidth over which these connections traffic information. And so let's say you have 10 connections, 10 users, and these users are all contending for bandwidth. You all want to watch different Netflix movies or consume some content, Disney, what have you. It doesn't matter what it is. And so here, typically in the service provider, especially as you go to these global service providers, they usually traffic in very, very large pipes. As we saw with the CECOM example, right, you had 32 terabits going from Accra in, in uh, Ghana uh, to uh, Brazil, right? So they traffic in very big pipes. And it's typically the case uh, for the service provider, you have really high bandwidth switches and routers, so they traffic in a large volumes of data. And so this is represented in this figure with a really large pipe of bandwidth R. So we have R sub S for the uh, servers, R sub C, the bandwidth for the client connections, and then the infrastructure providers usually have uh, really big pipes uh, with some bandwidth in this picture uh, at rate R bits per second. And so per connection, if you consider any two arbitrary any two arbitrary endpoints uh, in this uh, flow, uh, or if you consider any two arbitrary endpoints describing a flow from some source to some destination, you might stream audio from this server to that user, you might stream video from this server to that user, and so forth. Any connection uh, that you're going to get in terms of the end-to-end -end throughput is going to be the minimum among three things. And those three things are the client connection R sub C, the server uh, link capacity R sub S, or whatever fractional usage of the ISP's bandwidth uh, the flows are getting. And so all things else being equal, if each of these 10 flows is using uh, uh, an equal portion of the service provider's bandwidth, uh, you're going to get the service provider's bandwidth R divided by 10 is going to be that fractional bandwidth that any particular of these 10 flows might consume. And so in that case, the end-to-end -end throughput is going to be the minimum of one of these three things, RC, the client's bandwidth, RS, the server's bandwidth, or R over 10, that fractional usage uh, of the service provider's bandwidth. Does that make sense? Any questions? And so that's just really a more realistic version of what we had on the previous slide, where we're depicting uh, 10 flows uh, that can occur between 10 server instances pushing content to one of 10 uh, different clients. Okay. Does it make sense? Any questions? All right. So let's uh, just introduce a little bit of this. I don't expect to finish this. We have four more minutes. So I'll just go for two minutes just to make sure uh, that I don't go over. Um, when we deal with uh, a network, there are a lot of parts, which you're now starting to appreciate, that interact with one another. And the goal of these interactions is to give you end-to-end -end communication. Right? So there's a lot of stuff happening. So you have hosts, routers, all kinds of links and applications and hardware and software. And all of this mess, just mysteriously, not so mysteriously, it just all works together, right? which is, I think, a wonderful thing. And so whenever you have a large, complex system with a lot of moving parts, it's really key to organize it well in order to get it to work well. And so the internet works uh, due to something called layering. Now, this layering corresponds to, uh, it's software engineering, uh, a componentization of various types of functions or features that talk to one another, right? And this affords you two things, and we'll pick back up with this on Tuesday. It makes it easier to understand, but also you can change the behavior of things without damaging all the existing pieces, right? That's really, really important. So when we pick up on Tuesday, we'll start with layering and finish out the rest of chapter two, just layering and uh, talking a little bit about security. Uh, and then we'll go forward with the application layer. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? No? Makes sense? All right. So please um, look out for the homework. I'll post it literally about 15 minutes, maybe 20. Need to eat something. Um, about 20 minutes, eh, eh, 25, 30 minutes. All right. Give myself a little bit more time. Decompress. Um, 30 minutes after this, um, look out for that. And I'll certainly post on the Slack channel uh, that I have posted it. Uh, look out for homework one. And please make sure you slow down, pay attention to your units, and take accounting for everything uh, that's stated in the problem. Okay? All right. So I will see you all on Tuesday. Please look out uh, for the homework announcement on the Slack channel. All right. Take care.